Hello everyone, my name is Christian Varianu and I'm a senior emergency medicine resident here at the U of A. In this screencast, I'd like to discuss one of my favorite topics in resuscitative medicine, and perhaps one of the most controversial, ultrasound guided volume resuscitation in the critically ill patient. Perhaps one of the most commonly asked questions in critical care is whether our patients are volume responsive. Would additional fluid result in a meaningful increase in stroke volume? or would this result in pulmonary edema or other fluid-related complications? This question has been explored for decades and how to assess the response is controversial. The pendulum has swung in the last 10 to 15 years. We used to aggressively resuscitate patients, giving septic patients eight to 10 liters of fluid until we had to intubate them. And now it seems we are moving to a volume restrictive strategy, especially given recent evidence demonstrating the correlation between mortality and overzealous volume administration. I will prime this presentation stating that this concept and methods are challenging, and there is unlikely to be one right answer or method in every patient under every condition. What I hope to communicate is that the matter of fluid responsiveness and fluid tolerance makes intuitive sense, but that understanding its limitations is where the complexity really begins. This screencast is designed to help, help you better understand the benefits and pitfalls of different ultrasound modalities to guide fluid resuscitation. As a primer, please visit the Alberta Sono website and view screencasts on assessment of the inferior vena cava, pitfalls of IBC scans, and echohemodynamic series prior to delving into this lecture. Following along will require that you have some knowledge on the IBC and stroke volume assessment and acquisition and the arithmetic of stroke volume determination. This presentation will focus on strategies to assess fluid responsiveness and fluid tolerance two separate and distinct concepts that are essentially two sides of the same coin and must be considered equally in the care of the critically ill patient. To highlight the differences between these two concepts, let me present a case. Let's compare two patients, Mr. Clark and Mr. Hui. These are both patients admitted to the IC with septic shock on the same dose of pressors, escalating lactate levels, decreasing meaning arterial pressures. The question becomes whether these patients will require more fluid more pressors or more inotropes. Mr. Clark has a history of heart failure with an EF of 10%, whereas Mr. Hui demonstrates reasonable left ventricular systolic function on bedside echo, but he has an exprotic syndrome with an albumin level of 15. The same half liter bolus may not result in a meaningful increase in Mr. Clark's stroke volume, especially if he's on that flat part of the Frank Starling curve that we all know. In fact, it may worsen heart failure and tissue edema, Therefore, he may not be volume responsive and may also not be fluid tolerant. Conversely, even though Mr. Hui has decent EF and may handle the preload, to say it another way, he may be volume responsive, he may third space his volume quickly given his low oncotic pressure, and this may also result in significant tissue edema. Therefore, he may also not be fluid tolerant. Therefore, one of these patients is volume responsive, but neither are volume tolerant. The answer to your complicated clinical question regarding volume resuscitation isn't straightforward, and the ultrasound probe isn't necessarily going to give you the magic key. There's no replacing due diligence in the practice of clinical medicine. What ultrasound can give you, however, is some additional data points to help guide your clinical decision. Let's start off by discussing the topic of fluid responsiveness. This is the relationship between preload and stroke volume, the idea being that Fluid responsive patient will generate a higher stroke volume when intravenous fluid is administered, which may improve their shock state and oxygen delivery. In the literature, a 10% increase in stroke volume in response to a half liter bolus is generally described as volume responsive. Part of this relies on where the patient is on that Frank Starling curve. During this screencast, I will briefly cover the utility of dynamic indices, including IVC and SVC indices stroke volume variation, and variations in carotid artery hemodynamics. The inferior vena cava or IVC diameter and its collapsibility in the spontaneously breathing patient is often cited as the holy grail of volume responsiveness. You will recall that the IVC diameter changes th throughout the respiratory cycle. Measuring the absolute diameter and its collapsibility index can help make an approximation of the patient's right atrial pressure. This estimation was thought to definitively answer questions regarding fluid responsiveness. Unfortunately, the evidence actually demonstrates that its utility is limited. This review article by Dr. Scott Millington highlights the controversy and the variability in results in the literature. As per Dr. Leon Biker's screencast, 
linked below, the IBC does not seem to be the Rosetta Stone of fluid status it was once hoped to be, and in most scenarios is generally useless as a marker of fluid responsiveness for the non-ventilated patient. An understanding of the physiology will outline why this isn't the case. A one-time estimation of preload, or central venous pressure, also known as right atrial pressure, means nothing as we haven't actually challenged the stroke volume curve in a dynamic fashion. We still have not answered the crucial question of where we are on that frank starling curve. The same CVP does not mean the same for patient A, who's on the steep part of the curve, as it does for patient B, who's on the flat part of that curve. For these reasons, these metrics, along with other static indices, including the clinical physical examination, including mucous membranes, capillary refill, blood pressure, lactate, urinary output, and so on, these don't seem to be helpful for these patients off the hop as a diagnostic tool for volume responsiveness. Expert consensus suggests finding of static indices such as the IVC may be helpful of extreme. For example, near total collapsibility or small IVC can suggest volume responsiveness but should be integrated with other clinical data and ultrasound findings. On the contrary, clinicians have found a way to challenge that frank starling curve with dynamic indices in intubated patients with the ventilator. Recall that changes in intrathoracic pressure during positive pressure breaths will lead to changes in right atrial pressure and also impact preload. In these studies, patients meeting standardized loading conditions, including tidal volumes of 8 cc per kilo, normal sinus rhythm, have led to the analysis of the distensibility index of the IVC during the respiratory cycle. While this is more physiologically sound and a clinically important concept, Few of our ICU patients meet these strict conditions and the evidence is also variable. As a result, there have been only modest conclusions by experts that a distensibility index of greater than 12 to 18% may indicate volume responsive. Keep in mind that there are many pitfalls and limitations of IVC measurement. I again urge you to go back to some screencasts exploring this topic in depth. Interestingly, in contrast to the IVC, the superior vena cava examined through TEE or transesophageal echo has shown promising reliability via its respirophasic changes in ventilated patients. Analysis of the SVCs accompanied or accomplished rather with the midesophageal bicaval view with a TEE probe. Using this view, the M mode cursor is placed perpendicular to the SVC and the maximal diameter along with its collapsibility index is calculated. The 36% collapsibility index has been used as a dynamic indicator of volume responsiveness with greater than 90% specificity in ICU patients. The downside, obviously, is that the practitioner needs a TEE probe and the skill set to match. And given this heavy resource intensive test, let's shift our attention back to TTE and other techniques for volume responsiveness. Perhaps the gold standard TTE dynamic determination of fluid responsiveness relies on examining respirophasic variation of stroke volume or its surrogate, LVOT VTI or the left ventricular outflow tract velocity time integral and peak systolic velocity. This is very similar to the well-validated use of pulse pressure variation in patients with arterial lines and with TTE we can measure this directly. Recall that quantitative stroke volume calculation requires measurement of that LVOT diameter, but this is not required here. The LVOT VTI and peak systolic velocity is directly proportional to stroke volume if we are looking at trends over time. To measure these, start by acquiring an apical 5 chamber view and drop a pulse wave gated spectral Doppler just proximal to the aortic valve. From the spectral Doppler waveform, trace the VTI and maximal velocity through the LVOT and measure it at different times during the respiratory cycle. In mechanically ventilated patients, variation of VTI or peak systolic velocity by greater than 12% indicates high probability of fluid responsiveness. There are a few caveats to this calculation. Firstly, the patient must be mechanically ventilated with a tidal volume of at least CC, 8 cc per kilogram, and patients must be passive on the ventilator. Again, they may also, must also be in sinus rhythm. Instead of using the absolute cutoff of 12%, just realizing that the greater the variability, the greater the probability that your patient will respond to fluids. Secondly, there's a caveat that in the presence of any right ventricular failure or, or under function, this will decrease the specificity of this finding 
as this is another cause of respirophor respirophasic variability, and in some cases, this may contraindicate volume suscitation. Thirdly, any changes in tidal volume of PEEP can change your measurements. Therefore, any serial measurements must use the same ventilator settings. An additional method you could employ is the use of a passive leg raise technique. This is essentially the equivalent of a volume challenge of 300 to 500 cc's of crystalloid. Again, we are challenging that frank starling curve. This technique involves measuring the LVOT VTI initially and then raising the patient's legs to 45 degrees in a supine position. After one minute has passed, re-measure the VTI. Reports suggest a 14% increase as indicative of volume responsiveness. One advantage of this technique is that it has been validated in spontaneously breathing patients and also in patients with atrial fibrillation, provided that at least five measurements are averaged. As you have probably realized, getting optimal TTE apical 4 chamber and apical 5 chamber windows to allow for such clean quantitative measurements is very challenging. It requires a great deal of skill and adequate windows. A final technique that I will discuss is a bit easier as it includes interrogating a vessel that is easily found and that's the common carotid artery. There are three techniques to do this. One is examining the change in carotid blood flow after a straight leg raise or a fluid bolus. The second is to evaluate for a respiratory variation in carotid peak systolic velocity. And the third is to look for variation in systolic flow time. The first step for any of these measurements is to first find the common carotid artery in short axis and scan up to the carotid bulb prior to its bifurcation. If you are having difficulty, throw some color on it and find the pulsatile, thick-walled, non-compressible vessel. Next, rotate your probe to get the artery in long axis and measure its maximal diameter in systole within one centimeter of that carotid bulb. The second step is to measure the VTI with pulse wave spectral Doppler in the center of the vessel where you first measure the diameter. It is important to use the steer function and set the correction angle so that it's parallel to flow within the artery. The method to do this will vary depending on the machine you are using. The machine will actually additionally calculate the angle of insonation for you. You want that angle of insonation no greater than 60 degrees, so you may have to rock your probe or adjust your steering such that this angle is no greater than 60. This will allow you to measure the common carotid artery VTI B to B. Using this along with the diameter will allow you to calculate the carotid blood flow with this equation. Next, repeat these steps after a passive leg raise or a fluid bolus. According to a study in 2013, a carotid blood flow increase by 20% or more following a passive leg raise was indicative of volume responsiveness with a 94% sensitivity and 86% specificity. The formula for carotid blood flow can be a bit cumbersome. Therefore, you can look at respiratory variation in carotid peak systolic velocity. Measure and plug the peak and minimal velocity from the spectral Doppler waveform into this equation. Recent data suggests a 14% increase or more in pulse variation is suggestive of volume responsiveness with the sensitivity and specificity exceeding 86%. Perhaps the easiest way to use the carotid artery to test for volume responsiveness is to look for the change in carotid flow time. Flow time or left ventricular ejection time reflects the duration of blood flow during systole, and this is measured from the beginning of the upstroke to the trough of the incisional notch on the waveform. There are different equations in the literature for this, but perhaps the most novel is Woody's method, which corrects for heart rate. Flow time variability reflects changes in stroke volume with a fluid challenge. So measure this before and again two minutes after a passive leg raise. During one decent qualita qualitative study, a variation of more than 7 milliseconds had 97% positive predictive value for fluid responsiveness. Now that we've spent a great deal of time looking at the utility of some static and more importantly, dynamic metrics to assess for volume responsiveness, let's turn our attention to ultrasound methods to detect fluid tolerance or the onset of tissue edema that may prompt you to stop giving your patients fluids. Specifically, we will focus on the utility of lung ultrasound and a novel topic, VEXIS, which looks at solid organ congestion. There is a great deal of data reflecting on lung ultrasound's high sensitivity in detecting pulmonary edema, with a much higher accuracy than chest x-ray, approaching that of CT. Recall that A-lines are a reverberation artifact present in normal drawing lie parenchyma. We know this A-line pattern is highly predictive of low 
left atrial pressures as compared to Swansgans catheter, suggestive of dry lungs from the Lichtenberg study. During the course of volume resuscitation, serial measurements of bilateral hemithoraces can reassure you that the volume is not collecting in the lung parenchyma. This is an example of a lung scan demonstrating beelines in a patient that received too much fluid. This is a patient that may have low fluid tolerance. Recall that beelines are nonspecific and have a differential. However, the pattern of diffuse bilateral beelines with normal lung sliding and maybe bilateral simple pleural effusions are suggestive of cardiogenic pulmonary edema and low fluid tolerance. Any finding of other abnormalities, including a consolidation, pleural line thickening, subpleural consolidations, this may suggest other etiologies, including pneumonia, interstitial lung disease, carcinomatosis, atelectasis, or ARDS. Lung ultrasound is probably the simplest and go-to scan to evaluate for fluid tolerance. A much more difficult and nuanced ultrasound exam for fluid tolerance that is very popular, sensationalized, and up-and-coming is the evaluation of solid organ congestion. This is quite an advanced topic, requiring a solid understanding of spectral Doppler and hemodynamics. While we recognize that the respiratory consequences of volume overload are important, we are becoming increasingly aware of the negative effects of venous congestion on solid organs, including the liver, the gut, and the kidney. The VEXA scan, or the Solid Organ Venous Congestion Scan, involves looking at four main vessels and solid organs to interrogate for the evidence of organ congestion. The IVC diameter is firstly determined, as discussed previously, and then the hepatic vein, portal vein, and the renal parenchymal vein are interrogated with spectral Doppler. While I will touch on this exam very briefly, I urge you to read more about this as it's an extremely complicated topic and merits its own lecture. For an in-depth review of this topic, I urge you to visit the Western Sona website and watch Dr. Katie Whisker's screencast, which is a deep dive into the VEXIS scan. To give you an idea of how this is done, the IBC is first determined or interrogated, and then the hepatic vein is firstly or secondly interrogated from the subsivoid view following the evaluation of the IBC. It is seen as the large vascular structure draining into the IVC just proximal to the right atrium. Given its proximity to the heart, the hepatic vein has a triphasic waveform that is quite similar to the well-known CVP waveform. Primary components of this waveform include the S and D waves, which correspond to systole and diastole. A and V waves denote flow away from the heart towards the liver during atrial contraction and overfilling. Under normal physiologic circumstances, the S wave is greater than the D wave in amplitude, and during times of venous congestion, the D wave becomes much larger than the S wave. Severe levels of congestion will result in systolic flow reversal, and you can see this as a biphasic wave. Probably one of the most common scenarios and indeed caveats to this measure, however, is severe tricuspid regurg, which has systolic flow reversal as its cardinal future. The next step is to scan the portal vein and the renal parenchymal vein. The premise of these scans is based on the understanding of distal venous physiology during times of venous congestion. When overloaded, venous blood flow tends to switch from a continuous flow to pulsatility as demonstrated in this schematic. Eventually, at times of severe congestion, you may get reversal of that flow. The portal vein is interrogated either from the subcyphoid or the right upper quadrant view. Look for the vein with the bright outline and thick echogenic wall, usually a little bit more lateral. When you put color on it, you will usually get red flow or flow towards the liver from the subciphered view. Normal flows here are usually gently undulating and almost always above baseline. As you start to see venous congestion, what you will see is that it starts to develop pulsatility or dips with flow, coinciding with atrial contraction and end diastole as a result of back congestion. When you get severe solid organ congestion, you may get to and fro or pulsatile waveforms, and eventually a retrograde flow or flow reversal. The caveats to this, however, are notable. Portal hypertension can lead to abnormal flow patterns and can decrease the specificity of your findings. Finally, you look posteriorly at the kidney, at the interlobar renal parenchymal veins from the right upper quadrant view. After throwing color on the image, try to get pulse wave gait over areas catching both renal arteries and venous flow. This is just at the margin of the renal cortex and the medulla. Arterial waveform is above baseline. We will not focus on this for now. The venous flow is below the baseline and continuous and monophasic. And as you start to get congestion, you will start to get discontinuous flow, 
you will start to have a systolic wave and a diastolic wave, very similar to the hepatic vein waveform. And as you get severe congestion, the systolic waveform gets smaller and eventually your systolic goes away. And then you get a single monophasic diastolic wave, which is a marker of severe renal congestion. In graphical form, this is how you then use the schematics outlined by the VEXIS paper to classify the level of venous congestion in the grades from 0 to 3. Again, this was an extremely brief introduction to this exam. And though this is an exciting area of medicine, understanding, understanding of its limitations is important. Importantly, most of the evidence for VEXIS is in post-cardiac surgery patients and patients with known heart failure and cardiorenal syndrome. And thus far, there is very little evidence for its use in sepsis and in general patients with undifferentiated shock. Therefore, potential excitement about this novel area need be balanced by an understanding of the limitations and the lack of evidence. At the time of this screencast in June 2021, VEXIS has the least evidence and is likely the least helpful and most complex in evaluation of fluid physiology in the general ICU patient. So there we have it. We spent the last 15 or 20 minutes discussing the different strategies you may use to answer some questions regarding whether your patient may be volume responsive or tolerant. A common theme that should have surfaced from the screencast is that fluid physiology is nuanced and questions regarding responsiveness and tolerance become more abstract as you drill down. I hope this screencast has provided you with some tools you can add to your armamentarium when it comes to assessment of fluid responsiveness, including IVC and SVC dynamic variables, variability in stroke volume and carotid artery hemodynamics. For fluid tolerance, perhaps the most mainstream and currently most useful exam is that of lung ultrasonography. But remember that tests for solid organ congestion are coming down the pipe. So now that we've talked about the dynamic indices, we are left with the big overarching question of how to really approach our patients. We have the CHU tests. Those tests looking at the static indices that are easy to do at the bedside. Again, this is the history, the capillary refill, you know, physical examination, mucous membranes, blood pressure, IBC size. And then we have the tests we've just described, the dynamic tests, which are rigorous, accurate, precise, but very difficult to do. What do we do at the bedside? One influential emerging critical care doc, Dr. Haney Malamat, once described this conundrum in volume resuscitation. This is where the art and the science come together. I believe that you need both of these measurements at the bedside to make clinical decisions. It's up to you as the clinician to understand the benefits and limitations of the static indices in addition to these dynamic tests to help answer clinical questions. Perhaps those static tests, including the bedside physical exam and history, can serve in forming a pretest probability for volume status and patient selection. For example, most of you watching the screencast right now are in a volume responsive state. Determining that your stroke volume variation is greater than 25% isn't going to be that helpful. You need to use those static indices for patient selection, and this is important. With that thought in mind, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for listening, and see you next time.